Uh, this week, in honor of Dr. King's birthday, we're going to do something a little bit different, certainly something that's very outside the tradition of what the United States of America likes to do to celebrate uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, which is we're going to li listen to Dr. King himself instead of projecting our own uh, fantasies or uh, classist attempts to weaken his message, racist attempts to, to weaken his message or anything else. We're going to hear from the man himself. We begin our time with Dr. Martin Luther King uh, with one of his earlier recorded talks on the subject of loving your enemies, always a challenging topic in this day and age. This is from 1954, so let's give it a listen. Now first, let us deal with this question, which is the practical question. How do you go about loving your enemies? I think the first thing is this. In order to love your enemies, you must begin by analyzing self. Now, I'm sure that seems strange to you that I start out telling you this morning that you love your enemies by beginning with a look at self. I guess you could say that in this very early recording by Dr. King, we, we get a foretaste of his moral message, which was one of conscious and constant self-examination, constant review of the conscience, self-criticism at times, uh, willingness to examine and challenge your own beliefs. So his belief in loving the enemy, which he took very seriously and understood was a very tough assignment, was first to understand what was wrong within yourself that needed to change. Now, too, too many of us nowadays, I'm not gonna presume to, uh, you know, uh, understand the depth of these moral messages, but too many of us find it too cheap and easy to hate others instead of looking for the shortcomings within ourselves. It was a constant theme in Dr. King. Let's listen to a little bit more of this talk on loving your enemies now. No. That's another reason why you should love your enemies. That is because hate distorts the personality of the hater. We usually think of what hate does for the individual hated or the individuals hated or the groups hated. But it is even more tragic, it is even more ruinous and injurious to the individual who hates. You just began hating somebody, and you will begin to do irrational things. You can't see straight when you hate. You can't walk straight when you hate. You can't stand up right. Your vision is distorted. That is nothing more tragic than to see an individual whose heart is filled with hate. He comes to the point that he becomes a pathological case for the person who hates. You can stand up and see a person and that person can be beautiful and you will call them ugly. But the person who hates the beautiful becomes ugly and the ugly becomes beautiful. But the person who hates the good becomes bad and the bad becomes good. So the person who hates the true becomes false and the false becomes true. That's what hate does. You can't see right. The sugar of objectivity is lost. Hate destroys the very structure of the personality. Hate destroys the very structure of the personality. And yet, today, across the political aisles, we find too many people indulging in hate, hatred of the other uh, in its all its many forms, hatred on the right of immigrants, of different religions, uh, perhaps of different colors as well. Hatred on the left, to hatred on the left of the so-called deplorables, of the people whose political choices are incomprehensible because those people and the people who hate them live in two different worlds, two different structured realities. Now, we can say one is, reality is closer to the truth than the other. Neither is anything approaching the complete truth. And if we are consumed by hate, if we let that hate cloud our judgment, whether it's hatred for uh, for the Middle Easterners uh, who we, we're at constant war against, whether it's hatred for the Russian people who did not 
have a referendum on whether to invade Ukraine, yet we saw liberal democratic commentators calling for the suffering of innocent civilians there. Hatred is never a solution, and yet it's a luxury that all of us indulge ourselves in far too often. I want to move ahead, though, now to the last year of his life, the years 1967, 1968, which were really a critical evolution. We all know the history of Dr. King, the civil rights leader, but what he was really doing in the last year of his life, I think most experts would agree, is broadening that moral message to include some of the things that a lot of people weren't comfortable talking about. Militarism, war, class oppression, greed, uh, uh, dehumanization in all its forms, which is why, although people don't uh, recall nowadays, he was deeply unpopular, even among black people, and especially among white people in the last year of his life, people really felt he got, quote unquote, out of his lane opposing the war in Vietnam. So uh, I think it's really important to examine that. I want to start with some excerpts from an interview that was done on NBC News by Sander Van Oker, who asked some good questions, beginning with this one about how things changed for Dr. King when he took his battle is his fight for justice from the deep south into the north which as you know if you know dr king's history began in chicago but really towards the end of his life began uh became uh an all-purpose poor people's campaign so let's hear that uh let's hear that first clip now in the south particularly in alabama you had visible villains jim clark bull connor cattle prods police dogs but in the North, you don't have those visible villains. Isn't it hard to get your people aroused and directed at something that isn't visible? Well, that's exactly right. And this is what I was saying when I said it's harder to see a target. Uh, in the South, in the nonviolent movement, we were aided always on the whole by the brutality of our opponent. Uh, it isn't the same way in the uh, north. The other thing is that you don't have legal segregation uh, in the North as you do in the South. So it is much more difficult to get people to see exactly what you're doing, but uh, it isn't an impossible job. It strikes me in all the humility that this is a message that's so relevant for today. It's so easy, for example, to condemn the horrors of police brutality, Derek Chauvin, and and the deaths of other innocent black people, children, people of all kinds at the hands of police, they're horrific. We need to do something about it. But the invisible injustices that Dr. King is talking about, they're harder to organize against. And I'm afraid that particularly a lot of people in the white corporate liberal class use, uh, like the president of J.P. Morgan Chase, taking the knee uh, during Black Lives Matter, they use the outward symbols of injustice to inoculate themselves. And by inoculate themselves, I mean not only in public opinion, but in terms of their own conscience against the grave structural injustices uh, that are being enacted by them and for them against black people, brown people, poor people, uh, and the oppressed here and all around the world. But let's hear more from Dr. King. I think the other thing that uh, we must see at this time is that many of the people who supported us in Selma, in Birmingham, were really outraged about the extremist behavior toward Negroes. But they were not at that moment, and they are not now, committed to genuine equality for Negroes. It's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee an annual income, for instance, to get rid of poverty for Negroes and all poor people. It's much easier to integrate a bus uh, than it is to make genuine integration a reality and quality education a reality in our schools. It's much easier to integrate even a public park than it is to get rid of slums. And I think we are in a new era, a new phase of the struggle, where we have moved from a struggle for decency, which characterized our struggle for 10 or 12 years, to a struggle for genuine equality. And this is where we're getting the resistance because there was never any intention uh, to go this far. That seems to me so incredibly timely. There was never any intention to go this far. Yes, we wanted 
people to behave decently and politely. We didn't want those Southern sheriffs to beat up black people. We didn't want the Ku Klux Klan to murder black people or civil rights workers or anyone else. We didn't want to see people assaulted with fire hoses, rocks thrown at young girls and so on. But that doesn't mean we wanted to compromise our own comfort in order to create true equality between black and white, rich and poor, young and old, and that sort of thing. So uh, again, uh, a constant theme in the last year of his life, and candidly, uh, a major reason, along with his opposition to the war in Vietnam, for his uh, unpopularity in the last year of his life. And let's hear the next segment of this NBC interview. As Jimmy Baldwin said on one occasion, what advantage is there in being integrated into a burning house? And I feel that uh, there is a need for a revolution of values in America because some of the values that presently exist are certainly out of line with the uh, values and the idealistic structure uh, that brought our nation into being. Unfortunately, we haven't been true to these ideals, and many of the values of uh, so-called white middle-class society are values uh, that need to be reviewed and uh, re-evaluated, and in a real sense, they need to be changed. Dr. King's variation on uh, that quotation he gave from James Baldwin about being integrated into a burning house was he famously said, um, what good does it do to be given the right to sit at a lunch counter if you can't afford a hamburger there? Or words to that effect. I know we talked about a hamburger. Uh, and it's the same thing. It's a changing of the economic structures of inequality and of racism, which are tremendously interlinked, as well as changing the values that underlie both greed and inequality on the one hand and racism on the other. Uh, again, an increasing theme in Dr. King's towards uh, the last year of his life. Let's, let's hear another clip now, if we can. Well, you stood on the Lincoln Memorial that day in August, 63, and you said, I had a dream. Did that dream envision that you could see a war in Asia preventing the federal government doing for the Negroes, preventing the society doing for the Negroes, is that what you think had to be done? No, I didn't envision that then. I must confess that that period was a great period of hope for me and uh, I'm sure for many others all across the nation, many of, of the Negroes who had about lost hope, saw a solid decade of progress in the South. And uh, in 1954, which was, uh, I mean, 64, 1963, nine years after the Supreme Court's decision to be in the March on Washington, meant a great deal. It was a high moment, a great watershed moment. But I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future. But I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments. And I've come to see that uh, we have uh, many more difficult days ahead. And some of the old optimism was a little superficial. And now it must be tempered with a solid realism. Oh, I guess I should say, by way of setting this up, that um, Dr. King was, as I said, actively campaigning against the war in Vietnam. And he pointed out that uh, many times that uh, the war in Vietnam was taking resources away from the fight against poverty and that that therefore was uh, a, a harm being done at home as well as abroad uh, and that also the consciousness the sort of violence of the soul raised by militarism which is something we're seeing a lot of today in this country that that psychic violence that psychic drive towards violence was also making it hard to fight for justice and so nbc news reporter sander Van Oker asked him the kind of follow-up question to those remarks. So let's take a listen now. 
Dr. King, even if there had not been a war in Asia, would you still not have had this nightmare insofar as the Negro movement for equality then touched on two things that the white community holds sacred, <clears throat> their children and their property? Oh, I have no doubt that we would have encountered great difficulties, great problems of resistance if the war had not uh, been in existence. So that I'm not going to say that all of our problems will be solved if the war in Vietnam is ended. But I do say that the war makes it infinitely more difficult to deal with these problems. Uh, when a nation becomes obsessed with the guns of war, uh, it loses its social perspective, and programs of social uplift suffer. This is just a, a fact of history, so that we do face many more difficulties uh, as a result of the war. It's much more difficult to really arouse a conscience during a time of war. I noticed the other day, some weeks ago, a Negro was shot down in Chicago, and it was a clear case of police brutality. That was on page 30 of the paper, but on page 1 at the top was 780 Viet Cong killed. That is something about a war like this that makes people insensitive. It dulls the conscience. It strengthens the forces of reaction, and it brings into being bitterness and hatred and violence, and it strengthened the military-industrial complex of our country, and it's made our job much more difficult because I think we can go along with some programs if we didn't have this war on our hands. The psychic drive towards violence I mentioned earlier, Dr. King was so aware of the corrosive nature of that as he was aware of the corrosive nature of hate. And as he talked about that a lot, even back in 1954 in that uh, talk about loving your enemies that I mentioned earlier, now I'm not going to suggest that we all love our enemies as a nearly superhuman assignment, but he understood what militarism does to the psyche of a nation as well as an individual. And we should be reflecting on that as we collectively, Democrats as well as Republicans, uh, to a disturbing extent, exult, uh, not just are sadly, uh, have some sad feeling of obligation to engage in conflict, but exult in the great feeling of having an enemy to hate. Um, now, what I'd like to do is is perhaps uh, conclude the segment of the uh, where we clip from the NBC interview, which doesn't get seen a lot. And that's why I wanted to share so much of it with you. So let's go back for a second. I think the biggest problem now is that we got our gains over the last 12 years at bargain rate, so to speak. It uh, didn't cost the nation anything. In fact, it helped the economic side of the nation to integrate lunch counters and public accommodations. It didn't cost the nation anything uh, to get uh, the right to vote established. And now we are confronting issues that cannot be solved without costing the nation billions of dollars. Now, I think this is where we're getting our greatest resistance. They may put it on many other things, but we can't get rid of slums and poverty without it costing the nation something. This is one that I think every, uh, how shall we put it, a boardroom liberal in the country ought to hear. That, uh, you know, the, the, the cold uh, and yet compassionate honesty with which he says, you know, the initial gains of the civil rights movement were gotten on the cheap, so to speak, or a bargain basement, I forget the exact term he used, that now it's going to cost. It's going to cost to do the right thing. It's going to cost the nation a lot of money to end poverty, to create decent jobs for everyone, to create economic equality. Now, too often we see uh, Republicans engaging in culture wars and the democratic establishment using its own version of culture wars with symbolic embraces and sometimes legal and administrative embraces too, which I'm fine, I'm all for, of you know, trans people, LGBTQ people, marriage equality, all of these things are important, but they are gotten, if you will, on the cheap, because when it gets around to, but wait a minute, we're going to need a higher marginal tax rate. These corporations cannot be allowed to rape and pillage the planet and the country. People, working people, white, black, and brown cannot be exploited this way. Uh, all of a sudden, as Dr. King experienced in his final years 
all of a sudden the pushback comes. So let's not be distracted from the battle now, which is so similar to the struggle then, which is the struggle to make justice real at home, at work, at the supermarket, which is something that a lot of us are going to have to sacrifice for. When we continue with our playing of uh, some of the important and uh, often overlooked uh, speeches and commentary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in honor of his birthday, uh, we're now entering directly the phase of his career uh, in the final year that uh, many people say was the most painful for him when his conscience, his ethics, his religion, his view of the world, his sense of justice compelled him to speak out forcefully against the war in Vietnam and what he called the three evils of society, racism, uh, materialism, and merit, excuse me, and militarism. So we're going to start uh, this segment of the show uh, by listening to some of his famous speech where he came out very publicly against the war in Vietnam. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join you in this meeting because I'm in deepest agreement with the aims and work of the organization which has brought us together, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. The recent statements of your executive committee are the sentiments of my own heart, and I found myself in full accord when I read its opening lines. A time comes when silence is betrayal. And some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony, but we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. And we must rejoice as well, for surely this is the first time in our nation's history that a significant number of its religious leaders have chosen to move beyond the prophesying of smooth patriotism to the high grounds of a firm dissent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. <clears throat> Perhaps a new spirit is rising among us. I would argue, and many other people would argue with me, that silence is also betrayal right now when it comes to our complicity in the slaughter uh, of the innocent people of Gaza who had nothing to do with the attacks on October 7th. And I do believe, uh, again, if I can presume to say so, that Dr. King, were he alive today, uh, would be most likely to feel the same way. But let's go on with this speech at Riverside Church. From what, excuse me, from what I've read of Dr. King's life, he is not exaggerating when he uses the word agony to describe the struggles of conscience that he and others went through, the new spirit that he described among the clergy, the spirit of conscience and the spirit of rejection of militarism uh, was real then, and I believe it's real now in the many clergy that have come out against uh, some of the militarism we're seeing in our society today. So let us continue. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. So there again, he's talking about the agony he went through uh, and people telling him to stay in his lane and only comment about civil rights issues, particularly the kinds of civil rights issues that weren't economic, weren't threatening to Northern liberals, but he refused to do that at great personal cost. Um, and I just want to give you another thought before we continue. Dr. King so deeply 
And so viscerally understood the connection between militarism at home and, excuse me, uh, that's a Freudian slip, militarism at abroad and inhumanity at home, which is another form of militarism. And uh, he didn't live to see the militarization of our police forces, for example. But when you become a militarizing, colonizing imperial force, those drives in your society and in your social personality inevitably turn against your own people. And that's what Dr. King was afraid of. That's what he was observing. And that's what he remarks upon now in this speech. That is, at the outset, a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the build-up in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated, as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor. This destructive suction tube that militarism represents uh, in terms of both lives and resources is a theme that Dr. King returns to again as well, uh, over and over, I should say, in the final chapter of his life. And it's something that, again, is so relevant now, now that we've got the largest military budget in history, approaching a trillion dollars. That's the official budget, the unofficial budget, I'm sure, as well, over a trillion dollars a year already. And of course, the enormous death and destruction it's causing at the same time, a global military package being proposed now that encompasses Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and the southern border of the United States with no unifying factor among them except the addiction to militarism. And that's uh, that's so striking as a parallel between uh, 1968 and today. And what's also striking as a parallel is what Dr. King says next about the Vietnamese people and how they must feel we drop leaflets on them, uh, the Vietnamese promising them democracy and justice, just as we tell the Palestinians we're going to, you know, someday in the future, see uh, that they get their own state, even as we, our own bombs rain death and destruction down on them. So this next segment, while it talks about the Vietnamese and the particulars of it, or about the Vietnamese seems especially striking in the context of Palestine as well. All the while the people read our leaflets and received the regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. Now they languish under our bombs and consider us not their fellow Vietnamese, the real enemy. They move sadly and apathetically as we heard them off the land of their fathers in the concentration camps where minimal social needs are rarely met. They know they must move on or be destroyed by our bombs. So they go, primarily women and children and the aged. They watch as we poison their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roll through their areas preparing to destroy the precious trees. They wandered into the hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American firepower for one Viet Cong inflicted injury. So far we may have killed a million of them, mostly children. They wander into the towns and see thousands of the children, homeless. The children It's always the children, isn't it? It was the children in Vietnam. It's the children in Gaza now. 
It's the children that we have shown a stunning ability to desensitize ourselves to. Uh, Dr. King continues. And as we refuse to put any action into our many words concerning land reform, what do they think as we test out our latest weapons on them, just as the Germans tested out new medicine and new tortures in the concentration camps of Europe? Where are the roots of the independent Vietnam we claim to be building? Is it among these voiceless ones? We have destroyed that two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. Where is the two-state solution we have promised to build for the Palestinians? And as we test our new weapons on them, which we are, not just the Israelis who are experimenting with quote unquote artificial intelligence bombing and new surveillance technologies, but we, the United States, there, I read an article recently on how Gaza is being used as an experimental site for all sorts of new weaponry. So here again, Dr. King's connection between the concentration camps of Vietnam and the Nazis' experimentation on their patients is also apt for Palestine, the concentration camp of Gaza, the imprisonment and the de deprivation of rights and perpetual violence against the West Bank, and as we see now, the experimentation upon innocent Palestinians, men, women, and children, mostly women and children, with devastating effect. But I wish to go on now to say something even more disturbing. The war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady within the American spirit. And if we ignore this sobering reality, and if we ignore this sobering reality, we will find ourselves organizing clergy and layman concerned committees for the next generation. They will be concerned about Guatemala and Peru. They will be concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They will be concerned about Mozambique and South Africa. We will be marching for these and a dozen other names and attending rallies without end unless there is a significant and profound change in American life and policy. We are attending rallies without end, aren't we? We rallied against uh, the invasion of Iraq. We rallied against the pointless and brutal ongoing attack on Afghanistan, which ended more than 20 years later, where it began with the Taliban in power. We rallied against, we rallied now against the assault on Gaza. We have uh, a militarized response with no diplomacy involved at all, all around the world. The new presidential uh, $100 billion package includes uh, war for Europe with no talk of diplomacy, war funds for the Middle East with only symbolic pretend talk of diplomacy, and mil further militarization of the southern border of the United States with no talk of addressing the root causes there. The more things change, the more they stay the same, and the more we have to fight. Let's continue with Dr. King. It is with such activity in mind that the words of the late John F. Kennedy come back to haunt us. Five years ago, he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. <laughs> Increasingly by choice or by accident, this is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investments. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin, we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society when machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people 
the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside. That will be only an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. This, of course, was the time where, most of all, Dr. King was moving towards a unified message of white people and poor people together uniting in a poor people's campaign uh, that went on without him but uh, didn't have uh, the impact it might or might not have had had he survived, but he was making uh, increasingly economic justice a part of his message. There's another aspect of the last year of his life that gets overlooked a lot too, which was his uh, relationship with the black leaders and public figures who were considered more radical than he was. I'm going to play you, for example, uh, a clip for first from Muhammad Ali talking about the reason why he refused to be inducted in the draft for the U.S. Army and uh, then Dr. King's reaction to it uh, so that we can then talk a little bit about his relationship with people like Muhammad Ali. So let's play that clip now. I will not go 10,000 miles from here to help murder and kill another poor people simply to continue the domination of white slave masters over the darker people of the earth. It is a war that he considers unjust and his conscience will not allow him to do it. Now certainly I would endorse that, I would justify his action and I would give him my strongest support in his doing. No matter what you think Mr. Muhammad Ali's religion you certainly have to admire his courage. This is a good time to remember that while the prevailing narrative has tended to either whitewash the past, and I use that word advisedly in this case, uh, or to separate uh, activists, particularly black activists, into the good ones and the bad ones. It's important to remember a couple of things about this very important era of 1967, 1968 and this final stage in Dr. King's life. First of all, uh, Muhammad Ali was, if anything, an even more unpopular figure at the time <clears throat> than was uh, than was Dr. King, far more so, as a matter of fact. He's beloved now, and rightfully so, but at the time, he was a member of the Nation of Islam, which was hated and feared, and he was also uh, deeply, deeply unpopular for refusing to serve in the U.S. military. Frankly, those of us who were alive then, and I was very young, but I was a Muhammad Ali fan uh, in multiple ways, uh, are amazed. It's amazing to some of us how beloved he is now, but totally appropriate and totally justified. And uh, the same is true, by the way, of Malcolm X, who was deeply despised at the time, who was also a member of the Nation of Islam. But a lot of people don't understand the uh, the history of the relationship between Malcolm X and Dr. King. Uh, there's a very good book about it by Professor Pennell Joseph. But uh, Dr. King uh, grew in a way closer to Malcolm X. They disagree, of course, on the question of non violence, but once Malcolm X uh, left the nation of Islam and became a mainstream Muslim, his uh, religious faith 
was uh, much more uh, like Dr. King's own. They met only one time, as I understand it, which was at a Senate hearing where Dr. King appeared and was very surprised to see that Malcolm X was in, in, in attendance because just as Dr. King uh, <clears throat> increasingly became confident about expressing his radical message, the always radical Malcolm X uh, became confident about uh, using any means necessary, including legislation. Uh, so uh, there was the foundation being built for a broad and unified radical civil rights movement. I suspect it's no accident that that uh, didn't happen. Do you consider yourself militant? I consider myself Malcolm. I want to switch to another speech Dr. King gave in the last year of his life in which he addressed what he called the three evils facing society today, and that is racism, materialism or greed, and militarism. Again, incredibly timely right now. So let's take a listen. Yes, the hour is dark. Evil comes forth in the guise of good. It is a time of double talk when men in high places have a high blood pressure of deceptive rhetoric and an anemia of concrete performance. We crowd against welfare handouts to the poor but generously approve an oil depletion allowance to make the rich richer. Six Mississippi plantations receive more than a million dollars a year not to plant cotton, but no provision is made to feed the tenant farmer who is put out of work by the government subsidy. Crowning achievement in hypocrisy must go to those staunch Republicans and Democrats of the Midwest and West who were given land by our government when they came here as immigrants from Europe. They were given education through the land-grant colleges. They were provided with agricultural agents to keep them abreast of farming trends. They were granted low interest loans to aid in the mechanization of their farms. And now that they have succeeded in becoming successful, they are paid not to farm. And these are the same people who now say to black people whose ancestors were brought to this country in chains and who were emancipated in 1863 without being given land to cultivate a bread to eat, that they must pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. What, what they truly advocate is socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. But I suspect that we are now experiencing the coming to the surface of a triple-pronged sickness that has been lurking within our body politic from its very beginning. That is the sickness of racism, excessive materialism and militarism. Some 26 civilizations have risen upon the face of the earth Almost all of them have descended into the junk heaps of destruction. The decline and fall of these civilizations, according to Tornby, was not caused by external invasions, but by internal decay. They failed to respond creatively to the challenges impinging upon them. If America does not respond creatively to the challenge to banish racism, some future historian will have to say 
that a great civilization died because it lacked the soul and commitment to make justice a reality for all men. If you really want to clear out a room of Washington insiders, use a phrase like late state, late, excuse me, late stage capitalism. They don't like to hear about uh, that concept. Uh, they don't like to hear about uh, the idea that we might be living in a declining empire. These are things that are supposed to discredit you in the mainstream discourse. And yet, as Arnold Toynbee understood the historian that Dr. King references, as Dr. King himself understood 60 years ago, this is uh, a fundamental part of the American story. In the 60 years that have passed, there has been no progress, as far as I can tell, uh, in terms of advancing our understanding of the ways in which our civilization needs to change. There has been a lot of advance in our communal understanding of how the world works, and I'm happy about that. But I think uh, the phrase late stage capitalism would be one Dr. King would not shy away from, I suspect. Let's go on. The second aspect of our afflicted society is extreme materialism. An Asian writer has portrayed our dilemma in candid terms. He says, you call your thousand material devices labor-saving machinery, yet you are forever busy with the multiplying of your old machinery. You grow increasingly fatigued, anxious, nervous, dissatisfied. Whatever you have, you want more. And wherever you are, you want to go somewhere else. Your devices are neither time-saving nor soul-saving machinery. When scientific power outruns moral power, we end up with guided missiles and misguided men. <laughs> when we foolishly maximize the minimum and minimize the maximum, we sign the warrant for our own day of doom. It is this moral lag in our thing-oriented society that blinds us to the human realities around us and encourages us in the greed and exploitation which create the sector of poverty in the midst of wealth. Again, we have deluded ourselves into believing the myth that capitalism grew and prospered out of the Protestant ethic of hard work and sacrifice. The fact is that capitalism was built on the exploitation and suffering of black slaves. continues to thrive on the exploitation of the poor, both black and white, both here and abroad. We must also realize that the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. You caught that, right? A radical redis redistribution of political and economic power. He goes on. Final phase of our national sickness is the disease of militarism. Nothing more clearly demonstrates our nation's abuse of military power than our tragic adventure in Vietnam. I don't know if you noticed, but the applause got a lot more tepid when he mentioned Vietnam and militarism. It's not an easy uh, message to deliver, not then, not now, because people love their enemies, or rather, I should say, they love to hate their enemies. This war has played havoc with the destiny of the entire world. It has torn up the Geneva Agreement, 
It has seriously impaired the United Nations. It has exacerbated the hatred between continents and worse still, between races. It has frustrated our development of home at home, telling our own underprivileged citizens that we place insatiable military demands above their most critical needs. It has greatly contributed to the forces of reaction in America and strengthened the military-industrial complex. And it has practically destroyed Vietnam and left thousands of American and Vietnamese youth maimed and mutilated and expose a whole world to the risk of nuclear warfare. The American people must have an opportunity to vote into oblivion those who cannot detach themselves from militarism. We don't appear to have this opportunity today either, even though it's what, 65 years later? And those who lead us And so we are here because we believe, we hope, we pray that something new might emerge in the political life of this nation, which will produce a new man, new structures and institutions, and a new life for mankind. I am convinced that this new life will not emerge until our nation undergoes a radical revolution of values, when machines when machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A civilization can flounder as readily in the face of moral bankruptcy as it can through financial bankruptcy. And now the final words in this speech from a great human being, a human being who fought for civil rights and realized that his moral struggle had to include the struggle against greed, against militarism, as well as racism, who understood that it's one struggle despite these platitudes and homilies that keep uh, liberals comfortable and satisfied with their unwillingness to sacrifice and keep, of course, conservatives uh, happy with their own forms of greed. Uh, the uh, Dr. King puts it better than anyone else could. So we will give Dr. King the final word. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. Yeah. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth with righteous indignation it will look at thousands of working people displaced from their jobs with reduced income as a result of automation while the profits of the employers remain intact and say this is not just. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Yes. So what we must all see is that these are revolutionary times. I have fought, fought now too long and too hard against segregated public accommodations to end up at this point in my life segregating my moral concern. And so let us stand in this convention knowing that on some positions, 
cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And on some positions, and on some positions, it is necessary for the moral individual to take a stand that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but he must do it because it is right. tonight, we say to our government, we even say to our FBI, we will not be harassed, we will not make a butchery of our conscience, we will not be intimidated, and we will be heard. I'm Richard R.J. Esco, and this is The Zero Hour.